talking about eagles because I'm quite obsessed with eagles. I love them. <coughs> I've spent many um, hours actually standing on sort of little mountains and rocky outcrops and stuff and looking at these things. That's an American bald eagle. Um, I like hairy eagles as well as bald ones. Um, I like any eagle. Um, and last week we, we had a look at the eagle. We discussed how eagles either fly alone or with their own kind. They don't fly with everybody else who would bring them down. It's a good lesson for us. We looked at the lessons. We're looking at the lessons the eagle can teach us. And one of the lessons was hang out with people. Hang out with the right people. It makes a difference in your life. And we also saw that the, the, the eagle has superior eyesight. He can see things up to 3.2 kilometers away. He can see his prey. So if an eagle is after you, look out because they can see a long way. And the lesson from that we thought was Colossians 3 verse 2, set our mind on things above, not on earthly things. So much happening around us. We can, we've got to take our eyes off the circumstances and put them on Jesus. Then we had a look at uh, how eagles live. They, they only eat live food. The eagles don't eat dead food. They eat live food. And we need to also eat the live food of the Word. They also harness the winds and the storms. When a storm comes against an eagle, it doesn't get blown around. It sets its wings and it actually uses the power of that storm to raise it up, uh, to, to rise above the storm. So it uses the storm's own power to get above the storm. And the one that I personally really liked and related to was that when it is annoyed by pesky, annoying birds like crows and this sort of stuff that come and try and pluck out their, their feathers, they don't fight back. They don't react, they just rise. And at some point, all of the pesky birds can't breathe that atmosphere. They fall away. That's, and what a great lesson for us as people, isn't it? To not react to people who attack us and what's going on around us, but to rise above. And as we rise, all the pesky people drop away. Their influence drops away. We also learned that uh, the eagle renews itself, plucks its feathers out every year. And that's why the Bible says in Isaiah 40 verse 31, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. And so I think there's a lot of great lessons from the eagle. But today, I would like to look at how eagles teach their young. Because I think there's lessons in it for us. And if you think you're tough on your kids, you wait till you see what the eagles get up to. Okay, they are tough. So let's just pray for a moment. Father, I pray that you would just open our eyes, that we would see the lessons of the eagle, that we would realize that we are to be renewed that we are to rise up on wings like, evil, no, uh, uh, wings like eagles no matter what we face right now. Father, we commit our time to you and ask that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first lesson that, that uh, a young eagler can learn is the lesson of commitment. You see, eagles mate for life. They don't play the field. They don't shop around. They don't sow wild oats. They just mate for life. There's a lesson some of us could learn right there. <laughs> They mate for life. And so you've got to be careful who you link up with. Like if you've got one shot at it and you're stuck with them forever, you need to make a right choice, don't you? Am I right? And so often we don't do that, it, whether it's, it's uh, a marriage partner or whether it's a business partner or something. We just tend to go into that situation, but we don't stop and really think of, of what it's like to be joined together with someone who is pulling a different direction to us. So, why 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because the problem is you all pull different ways. It says, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? What has light fellowship with darkness? And some of you have experienced this. It's really tough. If you are in a relationship, I've been in business relationships with guys who are not Christians, and it's tough because when push comes to shove, you have a different philosophy behind your life. You have different desires and different things, that, different directions you want to go. So for the eagle, it's like saying, well, you know, you can't fly with the eagles if you hang out with the turkeys all the time, you know. And so if you want to fly with eagles, you need to join up with people who are pulling the same direction as you in business, in life, in anything else, who shares the same hopes and dreams. But eagles actually, this, is a, this looks like a fight, and in fact it is, because eagles audition their mates. Did you know that? You thought the voice was tough, I tell you. You know, these guys actually... So, so they kind of have little contests to see who comes out on top, because they've got one shot at this, they mate for life. They want to make sure they've got the best. You don't want to settle for second or third best. You want the best. And so they, they audition uh, one off against the other. 
So the lesson for us from this is pretty clear. We should just take time to really pray and make sure, if we're going to join with anybody on anything, that we are of the same spirit. Do I hear an amen? You know, it's just a lot easier if you're pulling together in the same way. Psalm 1 verse 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. It's really easy to, to join the scoffers in this way. How many of you know when you look around at the world at the moment, there's plenty of scoffers out there. There's plenty of people mocking out there. But the Bible says, blessed is the man who does not sit in that company. <clears throat> so once the eagles mate, they build a, le- a nest and uh, they feather it up with their <clears throat> build of twigs and sticks and stuff. And then they put lots of nice down in there, their own feathers. And then they lay some eggs. And so when they lay the eggs in the nest, then they're waiting obviously for the eggs to hatch. And when they hatch, you get things called eaglets. Do you know what eaglets are? They're baby eagles, right? You thought eaglets was like the eagle cheer squad, but it's not. It's the eaglets, you know. It's not. They're baby eagles. So what happens, what lesson can we draw from what happens when the eagles are born? Well, the second lesson they learn is the lesson of protection. Eagles always, isn't that cute? He wouldn't be cute if you were there. <laughs> a little bit vicious at times, I'm sure. Eagles always nest up high, away from any potential predators. The mother eagle carefully prepares the nest for its eggs and then cares for the, the, the babies when they're hatched. Job 39, verse 27 to 28 says this, it is at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high. On the, high, on the rock he dwells and he makes his home on the rocky crag and stronghold. You see, eagles live in high lofty places on sort of the side of cliffs or really tall trees and that sort of stuff. And they do that because that is protection for them, for their young. They want to take their young away from the mess and the filth of the world and they want to put them somewhere high and protect them. And I think there's a good lesson for us there, don't you? Because for our kids, do you want your kids just, just lost in the mess of this world? Or do you want them to rise above? How many of you would know that you want to take your kids away from that stuff and protect them? Is that right? Well, God is the same. He wants to raise you out of that stuff, the muck and mire of the world, and he wants to protect you. He wants to care for you. And a mother eagle is fiercely protective of her young. Psalm 57 verse 1 says this, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in, your, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storm, storms of destruction pass by. See, when the winds and the rains of adversity drive against that high lofty place, the mother covers the eaglets with her wings. And that's what that verse is about. And this is the heart of God. He doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you to to be smashed by everything that comes against you. But he doesn't stop the storm. What he does is he puts his great wing around you and he protects you. It is not his will that you should fall victim to the storm. But it's also not his will that you should not ever face a storm. He lets you face the storm, but he is there to protect you. Psalm 63 verse 7 says this, You have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. We should sing for joy, because under the shadow of his wings we have protection, an incredible protection. He loves us, and he wants to protect us from all the junk that is going on out there. How many of you know there's a lot of junk out there at the moment? Lots of stuff being talked about, thrown about on media, social media, government, you know, but Psalm 46 one says, God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in times of trouble. That's verse, that, that verse actually precedes a verse which goes on to say that, that, that he will protect you from the pestilence. There's a bit of current stuff for you. So today I believe some of you need to know that God loves you and he has his wings wrapped around you. Sue, as you go into your operation, God wraps his wings around you. He cares for you. He loves you. Whatever it is you're facing today, he wants to wrap his wings around you and protect you because that's what the mother eagle does and that's also what God wants for you. He wants to protect you. Now, the difference is that the the mother eagle will stop this after four four to 12 weeks. But God wants to do it for all eternity for you. 
He wants you safe under the protection of his wing for all eternity. As David wrote, 2 Samuel 22, My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. David knew that God was protecting him, and you can too, under the shadow of his wings. See, when God looks at you, He sees you as someone who is precious, someone who is special, someone who means the world to him. He sees you as someone who has value. So often in this world, people are treated as if they have no value. But when God looks at you, he sees someone of value, someone of purpose. He sees someone of destiny. And when he looks at you, he wants to protect that person of destiny because he loves you. And he has a hope and a future for you that will just blow your mind. So whoever you are, whatever you're facing right now, whatever you're going through, I've got to tell you, God just longs to put those wings over you and love you. He longs to just protect you and care for you because that's what he's about. The third lesson we can learn from uh, the eagle about her, her children is the lesson of provision. So as well as protection, eagles have to provide food for their young. This is where it gets a bit gross, okay, fair warning. Young eaglets are are directly fed raw meat from day one. Did you know that? They don't get milk or anything, they get raw meat from the the get-go. And all the men said, "Uh, uh, uh, meat, let's have a barbie, you know. The mother eagle feeds her chick by, by capturing prey and the tearing pieces of food off and then holding it near their beaks and then their little beaks come over and then they take the food from the mother. Job 39 says this, From here he spies out his prey, talking about the eagle. His eyes behold it from far away. His young ones suck up blood. <laughs> and where the slain are, there he is. So, so, you know, young eagles are not adverse to having a good sort of you know, meaty meal. They do not order vegetarian pizzas. They order meat lovers, okay? My wife and I, funny, we used to, we're so compatible, we'd order a pizza, be half vegetarian, half meat lovers. How do you even do that? But that's what we, you know, so that's what they're about. They are fed from day one like that. And the lesson here is that we as believers need to look to our Heavenly Father for our provision as well in everything. And look, I can tell you, as, as a Christian, as a believer, it is so easy to say, well, I'll provide for this, Lord, but if it gets really hard, I'll start to pray, and you can provide the bits I can't. No. It means everything. If you look at Matthew chapter 6, it says this. Jesus says this. Do not be anxious. Hello? Is anybody anxious today? There has been an explosion of anxiousness across our, our world, really. And so Jesus says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So don't seek those things. But then he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So if you want his provision in some way in in your life, seek first his kingdom. If you want uh, your family to prosper, and if you want you know, such and such in your life and jobs and all the, all the good things that life can bring. Seek first his kingdom. That's how, you know, if you keep seeking those things and don't seek his kingdom, then they will, buy, if, even if you get them, they will be hollow. But if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, you get all these things as well according to his will, whatever he will. Some things we want, we, don't, we shouldn't even have. You know, I, I took, uh, Fiona and I took Kaylee out for an ice cream yesterday. I'm telling you, she shouldn't have that stuff. It was dripping everywhere all over the place, you know. So some things we want, but we, you know, we keep asking for, but we don't really need and we shouldn't really have. You've got to leave it to the Lord. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, you will be amazed at what God does with your life and how he comes through in so many areas for you. Now, we've learned this year as a church and as, as, people, as the people of God to trust God for his bountiful provision, whether it's finding a property for us, which was a miracle to get in down there. I've actually spoken to a couple of property guys, and they told me that if, we, if they'd have known about it and we hadn't have bought it, they'd have bought it out from under us if they could in a heartbeat. It is an incredible blessing to be where we're moving to down there. 
whether it's $700,000 for Lily House, tens of thousands uh, for the church. Even we saw a $70,000 gift last week. Lily House had a $70,000 black hole and God brought it in. See, God is in the miracle business. Why? Because he loves us. Because if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and look to him instead of our own efforts, then all of a sudden he starts coming through in all kinds of crazy ways. Uh, Psalm 91 verse 4 says this, He will cover you with his pinions, which is his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You see, under his wings you find not just protection, but you find incredible provision. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things are added to you today. So if you have a need today, whether it's financial or health or relationships, whatever it is, if you look to Jesus instead of your own efforts, then you will be amazed. He will provide for you the same way a mother eagle provides for her chicks. Incredible lesson there. The next lesson is the lesson of training. You see, every eagle parent knows that they have to train the young eaglet to get out there and fly. You can't just leave them in the nest forever. These guys are not like, you know, the perpetual sort of millennial nerd who it's you know he's 47 years old and he's still at home playing computer games it's not that you don't get that as an eagle 12 weeks is all you get and then hey you got to be flying by that point so the thing is they actually use adversity and discomfort to to help their young eaglet want to get out of the nest because look nests are great you can snuggle down under the mother's wings it's really perfect it's really comfortable it's really cool i think i'll just stay here forever and no james 1 verse 2 to 4 says this count it all joy everybody say joy count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops steadfastness and steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. See, the young eagle needs to mature. It doesn't need to sit in the nest forever. It needs to mature because it has a destiny to move into. And when it's time for the eaglet to learn to fly, the mother begins removing all of the feather bits from the nest. So all you're left with is sticks and pricks and prickles and stuff like that. And that's not near as much fun. And so she pulls out all the cushy stuff and, and lets the, the young eaglet feel a little bit of discomfort. Because, why? Because she has a destiny for them. That's why Jeremiah says, uh, God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. See, she has a destiny for her children in the same way God has a destiny for you. But, you know, you can't just sit around happily in, in the nest forever. The kids get a bit uncomfortable. And then what does the eagle do next? Well, she throws the eaglets out of the nest. I know, some of you are saying, oh, I'm thinking about my teenage children here. But no, it's not what it's saying, right? The eaglet throws the eagles out of the nest. She does it repeatedly until the eaglet learns to fly. And out of fear, of course, she throws it out of the nest. The eaglet tries to climb back in, but it's very prickly at this point. So they're covered in scratches and bumps and, and stuff like that. But the mother doesn't yield. So to some, this would look heartless, but she knows. There's a method to her madness because she knows that the process of, is repeated until the eagle begins to start flapping and starts to fly. Deuteronomy 32, God says this, verse 10. He found him in a desert land in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them and bearing them on his pinions. Now, what is that about? That's talking about God's relationship with Israel. But God uses the eagle as a picture of that. And so what the eagle is doing here, the mother eagle is throwing the baby eagle eaglets out of the nest. Is she, She's throwing the baby from the pram. Forget the toys from the pram. She's throwing the actual baby out of the pram. And what happens is the eagle will sort of madly start to fire the little eaglet. But if he falls at all, she will fly down and catch, catch the eaglet on her wings and lift him back up. That's why they're at a great height. And so what happens, this goes on and on again until that little baby can fly properly. So she throws him out of the nest. That looks cruel. But then she dives down and picks him up. 
if they fall. And what a great picture of God with us. What a great picture, a beautiful word picture of God's tender love for us. He, he, he lets us go through stuff. He lets us feel the pricks and, the, and the, the sticks and scratches and all that sort of stuff. He even sometimes, we feel like he's throwing us out of the deep end. But he is always there to fly down and rescue us whenever we need. If we fall, he is there. People have this weird idea of God that God is out to get you. That's not true. God loves you. God is out to prosper you or not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future and a destiny. But it doesn't mean that we can, we can just sit around having a good time because God uses the difficult things in life to train us and mature us. Isn't that incredible? It seems harsh. But that's, see, the symbol for Christianity is a cross, not a cushion. God is not out to keep you comfortable. He's more interested in your character than your comfort. He is not there to just give you a a great time, but he uses the difficult things in life to make you a better, more mature, more complete person. Isn't that incredible? Those of you who are young in the Lord, you might be shocked. When you first come to God, he takes care of you and he he, he wraps his, his wings around you and protects you and he does that forever. He does that forever. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But at some point, you've got to fly by yourself, you know. At some point, you've got to get out there and do it yourself. And God will let you face adversity. He will even let you suffer the consequences of your sin. But he will always be there to rescue you in your difficult times. And we should rejoice because it's in adversity that we grow strong. Romans 5 verses 3 to 5 lays this out pretty simply. It says this, We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces endurance, Endurance produces character and character produces hope. See, there's a progression through here. And I know the difficult times in my life, they haven't been fun. But I have grown through those and become a better person and a stronger believer, full of faith, because I've seen him come through those situations for me. So if you're going through stuff right now, if things are difficult, if you're not happy, if you're not comfortable, then you are probably where God wants you to be if you will turn to him and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then you will be amazed at what develops in your life. The next lesson is the lesson of hunting. You see, it's one thing to be able to fly, but we're going to have a bunch of eagles flying and and not eating anything and, and dropping of sort of, you know, malnutrition. The eaglet needs to learn to hunt. So once the eagles can fly, or eaglet can fly, that's not the whole story. They have to learn to survive, to hunt and provide food for themselves. Look at that. Yeah. Look out, duck. Okay. Um, Look, this is reality. They, They have to learn to hunt. Hunting eagles, hunting in eagles seems to be an innate behavior or skill but it also has to be practiced how many of you know you can have an innate skill you can be good at something you still need to practice you know someone who's a good footballer might be naturally gifted but they still need to practice someone who's a you know a pretty reasonable musician still needs to practice and so these eaglets they they have a natural tendency to hunt but they still need to practice the art so how do they do that well as soon as they're born the eagles use learn to use their beaks uh, and talents to feed on meat and to, to, to tear flesh and all that sort of stuff that the parents bring to the nest. But they have to mature and learn to hunt for themselves. And they develop this by watching their parents. And this is where, you know, I'm, I'm so concerned about where our society is going because if our kids are watching some of, some of the parents around the place, we are in for a disaster coming down the line. Because we need to be modeling godliness to our children, do we not? We need to be living a life that our kids are going to look at us and say, hey, I want to be like mum, not look at us, or, or, or dad, not look at us and say, well, the last thing I want to do is be like mum or dad, right? So the eaglet watches the mother to find out how to do all these things. And she mimics, the little, the little baby mimics what, the, what, what they've seen the parents doing when they go to hunt. I always say to people, did you know that aging is compulsory but maturity is optional? It's so true. I can't stop you getting old. You can't stop you getting old. But getting old does not mean you're getting mature. There's plenty of old people I know that are very immature. 
And there's quite a few young people I know who are incredibly mature because maturity is not age. And you can go to church, you can be in a connect group, you can share the gospel with people, all this sort of stuff, and still never mature. Why? Because gaining maturity is not just about getting older or doing stuff. It's about having a heart that's open. And you will learn from the Word of God and from watching other Christians how to mature. Philippians, Paul writes this, Philippians 3.17, Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping eyes on those who walk according to the example you've set us. Join in imitating me, he says. That's a big call, isn't it? Hey, guys, if you're not sure who to imitate, imitate me. That's what he wrote because he knows that he is living a godly life. And so we should be looking around and see who is mature in Christ and how we can imitate them. Did you know that eagles can fly up to 13,000 feet, which is almost twice the height of Mount Kosciuszko? And from up on high, they can see prey 3.2 kilometers away. They can dive at speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour. Then they grasp the prey in their razor-sharp talons, and they can either grab it there and begin to eat it, or they can carry it off and eat it. But they learn all those skills from watching their parents. So who do you look up to in the faith? There is so much we can learn by following the example of someone else who's gone before us. I remember as a young Christian, I was looking around for people that, that I could model my life on. I looked at people, I thought, man, they, they seem to be really godly. I want to, want to do those things. I want to go to the same place as they go. I want to learn from their wisdom. See, most of us think that wisdom comes from Facebook. It doesn't. It comes from, from hanging out with godly people and letting their godliness flow through to you. And even as a young guy, I was looking around for people to mentor me, to speak into my life. I was actually, there, there's people in this room that I have asked, please speak into my life. People who pray for me, people who meet with me and, and share with me. And that's so important. Even as the pastor of this church, I'm not the top guy around here. I need to be mentored too. I need to look to others for maturity too. I've uh, hung out with Bill Newman for many years. And I look in many ways to him because he's a very godly man. And I get to, I get to see him on stage and in airports and all sorts of stuff. And I want to live a life that he lives because he's godly and he's righteous. That's what I want to be. So ultimately... You have to model yourself on someone. You have to learn to hunt for yourself. You have to learn to read the Word of God for yourself. See, just hanging out with Christians and going to church won't make you mature. You have to open the Bible and read it because this is the wellspring of life. This, this is the thing that when you place it in your life, the Word of God, then you can begin to hear His Holy Spirit speaking to you. Romans 15 says this, For whatever was written in former days was written to our instruction that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Have you got hope right now? Have you got hope in, in a world that is without hope? Have you got hope? Because I believe that as believers, we should be the ones who are, when the world is so dark, shining our light in the world. Do I hear an amen to that? I actually had an interview this week with a, a, a guy from the newspaper. So if you get the Sunshine Valley Gazette... Sunshine Valley, see how much I read newspapers. Is that the Lord? Could be, could be the Lord. Okay, sorry. Um, if you get the Sunshine Valley Gazette, you'll see there's an interview on, on us moving to Nambour and all this sort of stuff. But in talking to him, he said, well, what can you offer the people of Nambour? I said, hope. We can offer the people of Nambour hope. Why? Because hope is within us, because we have the Holy Spirit within us. Joshua 1.8 says this, one of my favorite verses ever. Joshua is about to go into the promised land. He's about to take the promised land after all years of walking in the wilderness, going round and round and round, 40 years in the wilderness because no one would ask directions. So they just went round and round and round. And they get to the promised land. They, they're about to cross the Jordan. What is God going to say to Joshua as he leads these people into the promised land? What's God going to say? Moses said this, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. The Bible should not depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do you want to be prosperous and successful in life? I'm not talking money. I'm talking life. 
I know plenty of people who don't have a lot of money who are still prosperous and successful in their homes, in their families, in their life. If you want to be prosperous and successful, put the book of the law in your heart. Put the Bible, read the Word of God. That's hunting for yourself. Don't just let me dish it to you every Sunday. Read the Word of God yourself every day. We've got a Bible reading plan. We should be using that. If you want true success, meditate on the Word of God. Do you know what meditate means? It means to chew over. It means to chew. I, I don't know if you know anything about cows, but uh, I used to, my family used to have cows, and I used to sit and read books leaning up against a cow's stomach. Can you believe that? A cow would sit down, and I'd go and lean against the cow and read a book. That's back in the days when we had books. And uh, I would lean against this cow, but I tell you, it is a noisy experience because their stomach is working, their stomachs, plural, is working all over time they are constantly belching and chewing and swallowing and belching and chewing and swallowing and that's what meditating is like when we when we put the word of god and we keep thinking about it talking about it understanding it because this is wisdom here so that's what we need to do so let me finish with this what can you learn from the eagle today the eagle teaches us many things i've gone over some last week and this week but today i'm going to ask you what lesson can you learn from the eagle today I have learned to embrace adversity, to rejoice in the problems I face, to harness the power of the storm and to rise above it because hard times grow us to maturity. For the eaglet, for the mature eagle, the storms is what makes us mature. And we don't like storms, we don't like pain, we don't like adversity, that's normal. But I believe if we face it with the right attitude, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, not our own way, that we can harness the power of the storm and rise above it. We don't have to react and fight back to people. We just rise above. See, most of all, the eagle has taught us that he wants to renew our life. And so many of us, we can sail through life just same old, same old. Have you noticed that? People are saying to me, where has the year gone? Has it gone fast? Does it seem to have gone fast? It's like before you know it, you blink and it's Christmas. Where is the year gone? We can just sail through life and, and just make barely a ripple. But I'm telling you, that is not your destiny. God has far more for you in your life than just raising a bare ripple. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. But some, you know, sometimes we have to face disappointments, pain and hurt. But what they do, if we allow those things in our life, what they do is they renew our life. That's why that verse says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Now that word wait is the Hebrew word kawa, which means to sit, oh, sorry, which does not mean to sit and waste time. When people say wait, if you're waiting for a bus, what are you doing? You're, you're sitting there wasting time, basically. But that's not what that word means. What it means is, is to keep doing what you're doing. It's what we call actively waiting and to hope with a look with expectancy. But the word also means to bind or twist together. You see, waiting on the Lord is when you bind or twist yourself together with Him. When you are bound together with Him, when you're kind of twisted and interwoven with Him, when He becomes so part of the fabric of your life, then you really understand what waiting on the Lord is. It's waiting with expectancy, knowing that your God is on the job, that your God is looking out for you, that your God has a plan and a purpose for you. And all you need to do is to yield to that and to say, Lord, I seek your kingdom and your righteousness and not anything else. So we need to be twisted to God at this time as we wait patiently, sometimes not so patiently for what God has for us. We need to be twisted together with him. As God says about Israel in, in uh, Exodus 19, 4, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Psalm 103 verse 5, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. See, there's so many lessons we can learn, but he wants to renew your life this morning. This is not just a, a nature program talking about eagles. If it was, I'd sound like David Attenborough, but I don't. This is not a show about eagles. This is about how God can renew your life can make your life as, as new. The Hebrew word for renew is the word hadas, which means to exchange. It means to take off the old clothing, put on the new one. And it also means to exchange our weakness for his power. That's why Paul can write in 2 Corinthians 12, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul writes, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong because he is strong. Isn't it incredible? As we trust God, he enables us to soar during a crisis, not to run when the challenges come our way, but to set our wings and to rise above the crisis. And we are to walk faithfully in this. Walking in the ordinary pressures of life can be much more difficult than flying above the crisis like the eagle does. So let me ask you, what are you facing right now, this morning, this week, this month? What are you facing that will cause you discomfort, that will cause you, that you feel like is adversity, that you would feel like it's a difficulty and you don't know what to do? I'm telling you this morning, there is the grace of the eagle here, the Holy Spirit can can get under those wings and can lift you above the storms that you face no matter what you face we sang earlier when the oceans rise and thunders roar i will soar with you above the storm i will soar with you above the storm how do you do that you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all this other stuff is added to you as well would you bow your head and pray I'm going to ask you to examine your heart this morning. Just open your heart to the Lord right now. Let all the pressures of the world, all the things you've got to think about, all the worries that you face fade away. Open your heart to Him. And I know you face pressures, I know you face concerns and worries. But right now, I'm going to ask you to lay those aside and to say, Lord, I'm going to open my heart to you. Open my wings and let you get beneath my wings. Let you be the wind beneath my wings to raise me up above whatever I face. Oh, Lord, speak to us this morning, I pray. Some of you here are really struggling with, with, with burdens this morning. Life is difficult. Life is is hard. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to just raise your hand where you are. Just give me a quick wave. If you're facing adversity right now. Yeah, there are. There's quite a few of you. Lord, for those who have their hand... Oh, just one, one more. Are there any more who have your hand raised if you're facing adversity right now? Lord, I pray for those who raise their hand. Father, I pray that you will pour your spirit upon them, Lord God. Lord, that you would fill them with excitement, fill them with joy that they are facing adversity. Father, just wrap your wings around them. Lord, protect them. Lord, dive down and lift it up when they need it. Lord, set their mind on things above, not on earthly things. Father, I pray that they would seek you and your kingdom and your righteousness not their own ends. Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name.